The last video went through finding the solutions outside of the well. I'm not going to go through the detailed math of how you find the solutions inside of the well because it's the same as what we did for the infinite well. So for the finite well, we have this type of solution outside the well, so where my potential is equal to v naught, and we have then this solution for the inside the well where the potential is zero. So next we have to use our boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions now are a little more complicated than they were for the infinite well. So one thing that's really helpful to do in these type of scenarios is to label the different regions. So in this case I have region, region 1, 2, and 3. Okay, So it's pretty clear that region 1 would be from negative L over 2 to negative infinity, region 2 is in the well, and region 3 is for x is greater than L over 2. So if we start to have much more complicated uh, systems, you might have more than three regions, that's okay. But it's really helpful to label the regions so you can really indicate what's happening. So let's think about what the boundary conditions are. So in region one, let's identify what the boundaries are. Now remember, boundaries are literally the edges. So the first boundary, if we start from the left, is actually negative infinity. So at negative infinity, or as we approach negative infinity, we need our wave function to approach zero. And the idea here is that our eigenstates are, well, in general, any of our wave functions should be normalizable. And so what that means is if we integrate that wave function magnitude squared over all the space, it has to be equal to one. We have to find our, our particle somewhere. So think about this as, okay, our, and there's going to be some cases where this isn't true, but for here, if we're saying that these are bound states, that our particles are in the well, it's not going to be found at negative infinity. So that's important. This is a boundary condition. So the second boundary condition is, in fact, at negative, so x is equal to negative L over 2. What happens there? There's a rule that our wave function needs to be continuous at all times. Now, a second rule is that as long as our potential is finite, the first derivative also needs to be continuous at all points. So at negative L over 2, we need to basically have phi 1, meaning the wave function as it's approaching negative L over 2 in, the, in region 1, to equal, so I can write this as kind of L over 2, has to equal my wave function in region 2 at negative L over 2. And this is really key. So this should be something that you look at and go, oh, this is why we talk about boundary conditions. We have some sort of sine, cosine type functions happening here in the middle. We then have something else. So kind of normal exponentials happening over here. And we didn't know what their coefficients were up front. So this a and b, we don't know what that is for a given energy eigenstate. We have other coefficients. I use different letters to make it clear that they're different for what's happening on the inside. And we also need to come up with an equation that defines the quantization of our energies. So this is going to be really important. So at this point, they have to come together and become kind of the same thing. Not literally exactly the same thing, but at least the same, the same value, the same first derivative. So then, and uh, I'm not quite going to worry about at this point. Um, we also then have, I will, I will go ahead and write it, that that first derivative, so I'll write it with respect to x, also has to match. And you can see that I'm using that subscript to indicate right, what's happening, because this is a piecewise function now. Okay. So that, we now have basically three constraints just from this region. So now, we could look at that second region, and again, notice that I have this boundary. Let's actually look at the third region. So at the third region, we have x, right? The limit as x goes to a positive infinity, I can write it the right way, I promise. What happens there? Well, again, our wave function needs to go to zero. This needs to be a wave function that is normalizable. So our wave function goes to zero. We again then have the other edge. So if x is equal to positive L over 2, 
And obviously, if the book's using plus or minus a, plus or minus a over 2, it all works out the same. This is just the notation I'm using here. But again, we now have phi 2. So phi 2 is, again, that, that inside the well wave function at positive L over 2 must equal what's happening in phi 3 at positive L over 2. And again, the um, derivative also has to be continuous with respect to x. I don't know if you can see that on the screen or not. So again, derivative here now from second to third one, L over 2. OK. So in this case, I don't necessarily need to say anything else because if I then say, well, what are my boundaries for the second one? Well, it's this boundary and this boundary, which, which are captured. So these boundary conditions are pretty important. What they're going to allow us to do now is put a constraint on these different coefficients and then eventually get to a constraint on the E sub n. So now again, if you're just like, OK, you know, before it wasn't too bad to do this, it's surprisingly going to be very hard very quickly. But I kind of know what's coming, so we can do this in a reasonable way. Let's first use these two constraints. Those are actually going to be the simplest to think about. So when we are in region 1, I didn't put a subscript on it, but technically this would then be um, phi 1. So this is the scenario outside the well over here. So now we can ask of these two terms, when we're outside the well, and we are going to negative infinity, what are they going to do? Now, there's one thing that's really important to understand before we do this. Phi 1 and phi 3 are different. They are both going to have this form, but they are different, OK? So, so recognize that this is we're going to have one version of this over here, one version of this over there. So as we go to negative infinity, what happens to this term? So q is going to be some positive value. 1, 2, probably much harder value, but think about that. So what is e to the, say, 2x, where x becomes negative infinity? This basically becomes e to the negative infinity. Ah. Well, that's just 0. So this works. This term goes to 0 as x goes to negative infinity. Nice. This behaves the way we need it to. Now we go to this one. This is e to the negative qx. So there's a minus sign here. So as x goes to negative infinity, this exponent goes to positive infinity. e to the positive infinity blows up. So one way to think about this is that as we're going to negative infinity, this term, right, you know, this, I'm sorry, not the a, but this term here, right, basically does this. But this term here is going to blow up. We don't want this one, right? So again, as we go to negative infinity, this term blows up. What this means is from this, we can see that b, and in particular in region 1, we're not saying anything about region 3, equals 0. So we only have this term in region 1. So in region 1, this term is fine, this term is bad. Now we can jump down here. In region 3, it's going to be the opposite. This term blows up in region 3, this term behaves well in region 3. So a3 is going to equal 0. So we now have a simplified form for what this is doing in this region, what this is doing in this region. We are then left with these much more complicated boundary conditions where we have to s start splicing this together. So I'm going to save that for another video, and we really quickly get to some um, pretty gnarly math. But hopefully this is clear. Again, make sure you understand what it means to use the boundary conditions and, and how we determine them. If it's, a, um, if it's something that we expect to be normalized, which again is most things, we will meet some things that aren't normalizable, we have to say that that wave function has to stay finite. It can't become infinite as you go really far away. The second is then these ideas that at any position, our first derivative and the value of the function itself has to be continuous in the case that we have a finite potential. So that rule is no longer true if we have an infinite potential.
we can't say anything about the second derivative. The second derivative is different because that relates to the energy which is changing there. So hopefully this has helped. And again, being really careful with our coefficients. Don't use a and b in multiple places. You will get really confused. And even here, putting that subscript on it makes it clear that we get two different solutions here from two different boundary conditions.